I like this story. This is a good story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I found it, and I thought, man, we got to tell this story this morning. Before we do, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to be talking about the most excellent, excellent way. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, it does not take into account the wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, it bears all things, believes all things hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. And if there are tongues, they will, be, they will cease. And if there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, that when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. Think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see it a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. As I said, there's a story. I read this week. I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, talks about uh, a fella, an actor who is playing a part of Christ in the Passion Play in the Ozarks. Now it just has to be Eureka Springs, and we've all been there. I think most of us have anyway. Anyway, as this man, this actor, was carried the cross up the hill, there was a tourist that began heckling him making fun of him, shouting insults at him. And finally, the, the actor had, had had enough. And he wasn't going to take it anymore. And so he threw down this cross, he walked over to the tourist, and he punched him out. And after the play was over, the director said, I know he was a pest, but I, I can't condone what you did, because besides, you're playing the part of Jesus. And Jesus never retaliated. So don't do anything like that again. Well, the man promised he wouldn't, and the next day the heckler was back. And it was worse than it was the night before. Finally, the actor exploded, and he punches him out again. And the director said, that's it. I, I have to fire you. You just can't have you punching one of the, the, the people out uh, while you're playing the part of Jesus. And the actor begged, please give me one more chance. I really need this job. I can't handle it if it happens again. Or I can handle it if it happens again. So the director decided to give him one more chance. And so the next day he was carrying his cross up the street. And sure enough, the heckler was there again. And you can tell the actor was really trying to control himself. But it was about all that he could do. And he, he did his best. And he was clenching his fist. He was grinding his teeth. And finally he looked at the heckler and he said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. You know, sometimes it's hard for those who profess to be Christians to behave like Christians should behave. I mean, we carry our crosses, but if someone crosses us, you know, we tend to lose our composure and we behave in much the same way as the, the rest of the world does, don't we? 
Uh, but the Bible teaches us that we are to be people who exercise love in, in all of our relationships uh, with one another. And I know that we are all just perfect at doing that, aren't we? Yeah, no, I, don't, I, I know better than that. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 says, Listen to these words. If it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2 it says, and again it says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And still another one, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. That's Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Now the scriptures say one thing, and, and it may be difficult sometimes, and not everybody we will say it's easy to love. I mean, there are some unlovable people in this world. It's next to impossible sometimes to live at peace and harmony with everyone. The 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter of the Bible, and we're going to look at the first three verses here as Paul begins saying, now I will show you the most excellent way. I'm going to show you the best way. The very best way, the most excellent way, this is it. He is saying, I want to show you this way. He points out that love is more important than five other things that Christians consider very important. Now we consider a lot of things as Christians to be important. Paul says, in verse 1, Paul says that love is more important than spiritual gifts. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the very first sermon was preached by Peter on that day, and he, he'd been talking a little bit about him quoting from the book of Joel, chapter 2, and, you know, God gave the apostles a special gift to be able to speak. You know, they had people from around the world there, from Europe and all over uh, the Middle East that were there, and uh, he gave the apostles the ability to speak in, a, in the language of all those people that were there. Uh, that they had a language that they had never learned. And, and so the people could hear the gospel message in their own language. And they could understand what was being said. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying that if God gave him the gift of speaking every human language, and even the heavenly language of the angels, but didn't have love, then he'd be nothing more than a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now what did he mean by that? Well, in the first century, during that time period in, in the pagan temples, when people came to worship, they would hit, an awake, hit this gong to awaken uh, the pagan god so that they would listen to their prayers. Now, I wish I had a gong up here to wake up some of y'all this morning, but... Uh, I don't have it right now would be that moment. But that's what they did. They would they'd hit the gong and and they would uh, wake up the gods so that they could hear them pray. Now here Paul is saying that even if he were so blessed that he could speak with the, the greatest eloquence in every single language, but he didn't have love, then his life was as useless as this ridiculous pounding of a gong to awaken the non-existent gods. You see, love is more important than any spiritual gift that you might be given. I mean, you could get up here and, and have the most beautiful voice and sing. But if you ha don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. In verse 2, Paul says that the love is more important than knowledge. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can phantom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing, Paul says. Paul says that even if you know it all, you know somebody that knows it all? Anybody know somebody that knows it all? <laughs> I see some finger pointing going on. Even if you know it all, if you know everything there is to know about nuclear science, if you know everything there is to know about medicine, if you know everything there is to know about Facebook, if you know everything there is to know about texting, if you know everything there needs to be known about philosophy and 
psychology and theology and every other kind of ology. And if you know it all, Paul says, but don't have love, then you're nothing at all. You know, it's always amazed me when people look at our society, they try to analyze, you know, what's wrong? Let's, let's, let's figure out what's wrong with society. We'll fix it. And things will be a lot better. And those experts, what are they, they always come back with kind of the same answer. We need more education. We need more knowledge. Knowledge, education. Education, we can solve the world's problems. When we get everybody educated, then we won't have these problems anymore. Now, education is a good thing, isn't it? It is a good thing. But, in some cases, poor education, it hasn't protected the unborn child. They know, for a fact, that the unborn children are alive and have fingernails at the earliest of weeks. Science proves that life begins at conception, but self-centeredness keeps the law in place and allows people to continue to do what they've been doing since the laws were passed. You know, I don't think education is the answer in all cases. I'm certainly not opposed to education. I think education is a good thing. But Paul says knowledge, you can have all knowledge, but if you haven't got love, you have nothing. He also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 1, knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. I don't think we need more knowledge near as much as we need more love in society. And we need a whole lot more love and, and the hearts of people need to change before society will ever change. You know, we've taken... You know, Christianity is really the religion of love. It's hard to compete against uh, the Muslims, Islam. Because there, there's the religion of, you know, if you're not a Muslim... It's all about hating the infidel. But Christianity is about love, and yet we've taken Christianity for the most part out of our society. And we've puffed ourselves up with more knowledge. You know, I, I believe our president went to California and he promised California $2 billion for global warming. <clears throat> climate change. I don't think that's going to fix it, you know? Because the, God is in control and we're headed down a path and the world is going to come to an end and He's going to establish His kingdom regardless. More knowledge is not the answer. And people are man manipulated a lot of times by knowledge that's sometimes not even based on fact. Now, he doesn't say that faith is not important uh, in the next the third thing. He, he, Paul says love is more important than faith. He doesn't say that faith is not important. He just says love is more important than faith. He said if, if I have faith that I can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it said, we're told in, that uh, it's impossible to please God without faith. And I trust all of you here this morning have faith. Or you probably wouldn't be here. But what is your faith? What do you believe for sure this morning? Do you believe that God is the creator of the universe, the world? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that He came to the earth and, and uh, He lived a sinless life, He died and was buried, and on the third day He rose again? Do you believe that, that He is now at the right hand of the Father, He's preparing a place for us that when He comes again, that we might be with Him and that one day He is going to come again He's going to establish His kingdom upon the earth? Do you believe that in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the arm of God, God's power to guide and to counsel and to 
comfort and to lead us in the way that we ought. If you believe all that, that is wonderful. If you believe all those things, it's well and good. And I commend you for all those things, but the Bible teaches us that if you believe all the right stuff, but you don't have love, you are nothing. Because even faith is of no value unless it's backed up with love. We have an example of the priest and Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan. They had faith. Problem was they hadn't they didn't have any love. And so they walked on the other side and they just left this guy dying there. He's just lying there, he's gonna die. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now that's a verse to memorize. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now last Sunday we had a little nursing home service. You know, our church doesn't do a whole lot to outreach. That's one thing we do. And it's pointed out to me that, hey, got faith, where's the love? Where's the love for other people? The only thing that counts, Paul says, is faith expressing itself through love. Fourthly, love is more important than generosity. Paul says, if I give all I possess to the poor, have not love, I gain nothing. Now, notice he doesn't say that if I give 10%. Right? I don't see 10% there either. Okay. He says, if I give everything, you know, if I empty my checkbook, if I give all my retirement funds, if I sell my house, if I cash in my life insurance policy, if I sit on the corner with nothing left, but I'm worried, but what I'm worrying, and I've given everything to help the poor, but I don't have love, I'm nothing at all. You see, generosity is not enough. You might, you know, ask yourself, are, am I a generous person? Are you a generous person? I don't know. How many of you get calls all the time? There's other people that want to find out if you're a generous person or not. Right? And I'm, I'm sure you get calls. I get calls from people uh, appealing for funds for worthwhile causes. And he asked the question, why, why, why do you give? Why do you give? Do you give because the preacher just preached a sermon on stewardship? Do you give because you feel guilty if you don't give? Do you give because you want to impress others that are sitting around you? Do you give because you're afraid of what God will afraid that God will get to you if you don't give? Or do you give because you think you're going to get more for giving? You see, all those reasons are what? They're wrong. Those are all wrong reasons. If the only reason that you give is to receive or to benefit yourself, then love is absent and giving is empty. Right? It is. And so the motive should not to give should be love, love for God, what God has done for us, and love for God's people, love for the see that the church continues on, you know. that we raise our kids up in the Lord, that we are able to send them the things that we feel like are important, like camps and put on Bible schools, because these are all, you know, we only get our kids for a week, these weeks in the summer, because the school, the world's got them the rest of the year. It's kind of important stuff that we deal with during the summertime, camps and Bible schools and all that. 
as we just got this little bit of time, and there's only so many Bible schools and so many camps over a number of years as they're growing up that's going to shape and mold them the rest of their life. And we're fighting a battle. The world wants to pull them one way. It's got them most of the time. I remember uh, talking to Tommy and Leona McGinney years ago when their kids were in, in school and how they could tell the big difference in their children when they were in school and then when it's summertime when they were out of school. Because there's that influence. I'm not saying that they were doing anything bad or anything. You know, I'm, just, I'm just saying I remember that conversation of just how their attitude was different about life. And we got them for a little bit of time. And we don't support these things. But we don't do it just to be throwing money at it. We do it because the motivation should be the love of our children and our young people and what God has done for us. Then he says that love is more important than accomplishments. He says, I surrender. You know, if I surrender my body to the flames. Remember, uh, occasionally you'll see somebody doing this. I remember during the Vietnam War, somebody set themselves on fire for their religion. And I think, you know, I'm sure it's been done since then. What was that? that? There was a young lady who set herself on fire that brought about what was called the uh, uh, Arab Spring a couple years ago. It started the revolution of overthrowing the governments in the Middle East. Paul says, if I surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. You know, he's talking about mart martyrdom. He's talking about being so faithful to a cause, so committed, in our case, to God, that you'd end up dying because of your faith. Now, none of us really know whether we'd be willing to do that or not. But there are Christians every single day that are faced with this in the Middle East under the rule of Islam where if they get together as Christians, you know, their homes might be burned, their churches might be burned, they might be executed because of their faith. One preacher who was a pastor in, uh, in uh, not Syria, but in Iran, uh, he was warned not to preach, to confess to Islam, and, and he was in prison a couple times. He still didn't do what uh, the people wanted him to do, the, the government. And the next time they executed him and sent his, cut him up, and sent his body back to his church. The other thing they do, I heard this true story. I'm trying to gross you out or trying to make you do and all or whatever, but I'm just telling you, this is what goes on in the world. Uh, you know, a lot of Christians have been buried alive in sand and until they're dead. You know. People are dying for Jesus Christ. But even at that, even if you're willing to lay down your life for God, if you have not love, Paul says, still nothing. And Paul, he was willing to lay down his life, and he did for Christ. He's saying that even if you go to church every time the doors are open, if you read your Bible faithfully, if you pray and do all the things that a Christian ought to do, then if, and if there's no love behind all of that, then nothing is right in God's sight. He's saying that love is more important than spiritual gifts. It's more important than knowledge. It's more important than having all kinds of faith. It's more important than generosity. It's more important than all the things that you might accomplish for the kingdom of God. If you haven't got love, you got nothing. There's the rub. 
How do we do it every single day in our lives, in our homes? Jesus says in John 13, 34, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. Notice it says it's a commandment. Not a suggestion. You're not saying, you know, love all the good people. Is love one another. You know, we tend to think that love is something that just happens because that's what the world teaches us. You fall in love like you fall into a ditch, right? Oh, we just, we fell in love. You know what the world teaches? Like you fall into a ditch. You fall out of love, hey, you fall out of a tree. You just fell out of love. Can't help it. It's just something that happens to you. Someone sings, I can't help falling in love with you. Or someone sings, you've lost that loving feeling. Someone else sings, I love you. Please tell me your name. You know, that's really deep stuff right there, isn't it? I'm in love. But the Bible teaches that love is something we can control. It's a choice. You can love somebody and not like them. You may not like what they're doing, but you, God commands us to love each other. Which means, you know, I can will to love you. Pretty hard for some of you kids there, you know, for me to... But I think I can, I think I can muster up the will to love some of you. No, I'm just kidding. Love really is a choice, isn't it? You choose. You choose. It is a choice. And so it's not this hopeless situation, you know. It doesn't fall out of a tree. It doesn't you know, fall into a ditch. Philippians 2, 4, Paul says that he wants us to behave as Jesus Christ behaved. In other words, love the same way that Jesus loved. He also said it's, each of us should look not at your own interest, but in the interest of others. In other words, love becomes unselfish. You begin to think about other people and their interests. Instead of thinking about your interests, you become unselfish. Now, there's all kinds of places to apply this stuff. At home, marriage relationship, in the church. Jesus, in fact, said, uh, you'll know we are Christians by our love. By this, they shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And he also says, this is, this is the way. If you want... To show the world Christ, what Christ is all about, Christianity is all about. If you want to show the world, find out what the real message of Jesus Christ is, that it is valid, you will demonstrate love to others. You'll choose to love even the unlovely. People you can't even get along with sometimes. You'll have compassion the way Jesus had compassion for other people. And you remember getting caught up in a movie and you get so caught up. Anybody cry in the movies besides me? And I didn't used to do this until I got in my 40s, I think. I, I literally cried uh, during a movie. It was about a parrot. I can't remember the Debbie might remember the name of the, the movie. Polly, yeah, that was it. And tears are rolling down my eyes over here. I don't know, I can't remember. Don't bring it up, I might start in. But to feel compassion about other people is, 
to know what they feel. It's like it causes us to ask the same tough questions. You know, what, what's it like to hurt deep inside and no one knows you're hurting? And you don't feel free to tell them that you're hurting. What's it like to being sick and knowing you're not going to get well? And wanting more than anything else to live. What's it like to be handicapped? What's it like to be a minority? You know, we always think about minorities in our, our, our country, and it certainly has been brought out. I was listening to a guy on the radio. He was talking about how he was a white guy. He had moved to Hawaii, and at their, the white people are minorities, and they're hated. I always wanted to live in Hawaii. Now I don't know that I want to live in Hawaii anymore. But you're a minority in Hawaii, and they hate the white people over there. I mean, there's this... What's it like, though, to be a minority? What's it like to be dealing with marital problems and domestic problems? What's it like? What, what kind of burdens are people carrying, and do we care enough to help them with their burdens? That's what it means when Jesus talks about loving one another as He loved us. And finally, we are to let the love flow into the workplace. Got a hard boss, don't like him very much. Work with somebody that makes fun of you because, you know, I've, I've done that. Used to drive a school bus to bring by our school system. I got called preacher and Father Tom. Didn't like it very much. I didn't let them know. Jesus said we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. In fact, Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 20 and 21, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a good story it's, uh, about a guy named Doug Nicholas. I'll close with that this morning. And anyway, it illustrates what we're trying to say uh, this morning in this message. Doug went to India to be a missionary there. And while he was there, he started, he started to study the language to communicate with the people of India. And he was infected with uh, tuberculosis. And he had to be put into a sanitarium. And it wasn't a very good place. It wasn't a very clean place. The conditions were awful. There were a lot of sick people there. And so Doug decided he was going to do the best he could in that situation. He took a lot of his Christian books and pamphlets and tracts and all that with him. And he thought he would try to witness while he was in the sanitarium with other patients. And when he tried to pass out the tracks, uh, they didn't want him. He was rejected. Nobody wanted them. He tried to hand out books. No one would take them. He tried to witness, but he was handicapped because of his inability to communicate in their language. And he was real discouraged. And here he was because of his illness. He was going to be there a long time. It seemed like uh, the work that he'd come over there to do uh, wasn't going to get done because nobody would listen to him. And here he has this illness, and every night about 2 o'clock, he'd wake up coughing, and the coughing wouldn't quit. And one night he woke up, he noticed across the aisle there was an old man trying to get out of bed, and he said the man uh, would roll himself into a little ball and teeter back and forth and try to get himself up and stand on his feet, but he just couldn't do it. He was too weak. And uh, finally, after several attempts, the old man laid back down and cried. Next morning, Doug understood why the man was crying. He was trying to get up to go to the bathroom. But he didn't have enough strength to do that. And so his bed was a mess. There was a smell in the air. The other patients made fun of the old man. 
The nurses came to clean up his bed and they weren't kind to him either. They, one nurse even slapped him in the face. And Doug said that old man just laid there and cried. And Doug said, the next night about 2 o'clock I started coughing again. I looked across the way and there was an old man trying to get out of bed once more. And I really didn't want to, but somehow I managed to get up and I walked across the aisle and I helped the old man stand up. But he was too weak to walk, Doug said. I took him in my arms. I carried him like a baby. He was so... He was so light that it wasn't a difficult task. I took him into the bathroom, which was nothing more than a dirty hole in the floor. I stood behind him. I cradled him in my arms as he took care, as he took care of himself. And then I carried him back to his bed and laid him down. And as I turned to leave, he reached up and he grabbed me by the face and pulled me close and kissed me on the cheek and said what I think was thank you. Doug said the next morning there was patients waiting when he, was, when he woke up and they asked if they could read some of his books and tracts that he had brought. Others had, uh, had questions about God and how he worshipped and about his only begotten son and how he had come into the world and, and uh, died for their sins. Doug says that in the next few weeks he gave out all the literature that he brought. Many of the doctors and the nurses and the patients and the sanitarium came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And he said, now, what did I do? I didn't preach. I couldn't even communicate in their language. I didn't have a great lesson to teach them. I didn't have a wonderful things to offer. I didn't all I did was take an old man to the bathroom and anyone can do that. Someone has said they will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's the more excellent way Paul was talking. Our God is